Hello, I'm Reverend Dave Clark and welcome to Marwan Baptist Church and to our morning service online. Hi to our regular members, but also to any of you who are new to us. Check our website www.marwanbaptistchurch.org.uk to see how you can connect with our church community. We're now going to sing our first song, Lo, in the grave he lay. First reading is taken from uh, the New Testament, uh, Luke 24, verses 36 to 49. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and arise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. Beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Let's pray. Jesus, just as you did by your resurrection appearance to the disciples, bring us now peace in our trouble, revelation in our darkness, understanding to our ignorance, and direction in our bewilderment. Amen. We'll now sing again. Uh, I cast my mind to Calvary. I 
Our intercessory prayers this morning are prepared by Colin Clutterbuck. 1 Timothy 2 says, I exhort therefore first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, thanksgivings be made for all men, for kings and all that are in high places, that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and gravity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour. Who would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. We pray for all states, men and governments who work to improve international relations, especially at this time when the virus is affecting every country, that good may come out of evil, that combating the virus may provide a unifying factor in international relations, and ways may be found to reconcile people of different races, religions and political systems. May the aftermath of this pandemic not result in rioting and unrest, but may men and women the world over experience more freedom, security and peace. We pray for all who suffer as a result of this pandemic. We pray for those whose faith in God and in humanity has seen 
been weakened or lost through what they have experienced or seen. We pray for the homeless and refugees, for those who go hungry and have little hope, for all who have lost livelihood and security, for those who have lost husband or wife, children or parents, loved ones, partners and friends. Especially we pray for those who have no hope in Christ to sustain them in their grief, that through the work of your gracious Holy Spirit they may experience the grace, forgiveness and hope only to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for doctors, nurses and carers who daily put themselves at risk that every effort may be made for their protection. We pray that Almighty God may hold them in his arms of love. We pray for our link churches in Chelmsley Wood and in Volgograd. We pray for Neil Roberts and his team, thanking you for all that they have achieved in the Chelmsley community over the years and asking that you will continue to encourage and bless their labours. We pray for our link churches in Volgograd, for whom the coronavirus places another constraint upon an already oppressive and difficult situation for worship and witness. We pray for our link missionaries in Nepal, Angus and Helen Douglas and their family, who have had to cancel a home visit to the UK and are working under similar restrictions to ourselves, with homeschooling and additional responsibility. We pray for those who mourn the loss of loved ones in this fellowship, especially the families of Sheila Griffiths, Paul Hearn and Lorna Boone. We pray for the widows and widowers of our fellowship, whose loss of a loved one is especially poignant and painful in these times of enforced isolation. May they experience the comfort and hope which only you can bring. Finally, we bring to you the needs of those who need your healing. Janet Raggett for her sight, Hilfa Jones following her fall, and Ralph Hall after his cycle accident. Bless us and comfort us in whatever problems we face at this present time, and may your blessed comforter, the Holy Spirit, be with us now and throughout the coming days. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Let us say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Here in Melbourne Baptist Church we support a number of Christian charities and this morning our charity champion for Mission Aviation Fellowship David Snell will tell us something of their work. Good morning everyone. Today I am going to give a brief talk about Mission Aviation Fellowship MAF which is one of the charities currently supported by this church. MAF is 75 years old this year their vision statement is, At MAF we believe nothing should stop people from receiving the love of God and the essentials of life, <clears throat> no matter how remote they are. Our vision is to see isolated people physically and spiritually transformed in Christ's name. We believe that everyone deserves a chance to experience the love of Jesus Christ. We use aviation and technology We use aviation and technology because in many places those are the only ways to reach isolated people with Christ's love. MAF is one of the busiest airlines in the world in terms of individual flights making about one takeoff or landing every three minutes. It began soon after World War II in order to sp spread the gospel of Jesus in hard to reach places. The UK branch now supports missionary endeavour in about 26 countries, flying aid and missionary workers to remote places which are hard or dangerous to reach by road. Just as an example, one of the places where there is an extensive operation is Papua New Guinea, which is a country of varied terrain, having highlands in the west to tropical lowlands in the east.
and requiring a range of flying skills. There are over 30 international staff and 100 nationals deployed in a number of areas in the country. They also have a large base in Arnhem Land at the northern tip of Australia where they do major service work on aircraft deployed in the Philippines area and provide training for aircraft and avionics engineers. One of the most dramatic tasks is the flying of medical emergencies to the nearest major hospital, aircraft often being diverted to carry out this task. Many lives have been saved in this way. MAF also supports overseas and aid organisations with their IT and vehicle maintenance requirements, which are both required for its own operation. MAF employs pilots, aircraft engineers, avionics engineers, IT personnel, managers and many others. Many of the MAF personnel are nationals of the country in which they are working. It also uses a number of different types of small plane in its operations, including a number of float planes in places like Bangladesh and Lake Victoria, Uganda. At one time it used helicopters in the really rugged places and the book Wings Like Eagles describes the experiences of one helicopter pilot, David Marfleet, about 30 years ago in Irian Jawa at the western end of Papua. I have a spare copy of this book if anyone would like to read it. Obviously, it costs a lot to operate a mini airline. And though it does make a charge for its flights, the majority of its operating costs come from donations. So I am pleased that Abbey Road Baptist Church supports such a worthwhile organisation. Now I would like to show a short video outlining some of the work MAF do in a number of different countries. Finally, some items from the MAF Current Prayer Diary. Praise God for MAF's ability to assist students in South Sudan. We fly high quality educational materials to remote locations like Iba Girls School. With their support, MAF flights provide, many pupils were able to receive the books they need to gain proper education. Papua New Guinea has more than 800 languages and over 1,000 district ethnic groups. So in order to communicate, people use a trade language called Toka Pisin. With extremely high demand for God's word, please pray for the smooth and efficient printing of the Tok Pisin Bibles our pilots distribute. Thank you all again for your support of MAF.
Welcome to our second message in the book of Ezekiel and we're starting to read Ezekiel chapter 2 verses 9 and continuing to Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 15. Then I looked and I saw a hand stretched out to me. In it was a scroll which he unrolled before me. On both sides of it were written words of lament and mourning and woe. And he said to me, Son of man, eat what is before you, eat this scroll, then go and speak to the people of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he gave me the scroll to eat. Then he said to me, Son of man, eat this scroll I am giving you, and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it, and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. Then he said to me, Son of man, Go now to the people of Israel and speak my words to them. You are not being sent to a people of obscure speech and strange language, but to the people of Israel. Not to many peoples of obscure speech and strange language whose words you cannot understand. Surely if I had sent you to them, they would have listened to you. But the people of Israel are not willing to listen to you, because they are not willing to listen to me. For all the Israelites are hardened and obstinate but I will make you as unyielding and hardened as they are. I will make your forehead like the hardest stone, harder than flint. Do not be afraid of them or terrified by them, though they are a rebellious people. And he said to me, Son of man, listen carefully and take heart all the words I speak to you. Go now to your people in exile and speak to them. Say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, whether they listen or fail to listen. Then the Spirit lifted me up, and I heard behind me a loud rumbling sound as the glory of the Lord arose from the place where it was standing. It was the sound of the wings of the living creatures brushing against each other, and the sound of the wheels beside them, a loud rumbling sound. The Spirit then lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness and in the anger of my spirit with the strong hand of the Lord on me. I came to the exiles who lived at Tel Aviv near the Kibar River, and there, where they were living, I sat among them for seven days, deeply distressed. Last week we looked at Ezekiel's dramatic call to be a prophet. That's where he saw incredible visions of heavenly creatures and the glory of God as he was exiled near Babylon. This week we're going to learn more about his calling to be a prophet to the exiled people of Judah. And how this might be an encouragement to us in our lockdown situation. In chapter 2, God warns Ezekiel that he is giving him a tough assignment. And at the end, Ezekiel sees a vision of a hand containing a scroll on which are written words of lament and mourning and woe. Ezekiel has a tough message to deliver. As a nation, we are getting a lot of bad news at present. It's relentless. The politicians are pushed by the press to say when the lockdown restrictions are going to be released, when the PPE deliveries are going to be made. And the politicians are desperate to deliver some good news. But they're now being criticised by the same press when those promised deliveries don't always arrive. All of us want to hear good news and not bad news. And Ezekiel's message to the exiles is that you are here hundreds of miles from home because of your rebellion against God. Your exile will not end soon. Jerusalem and its temple will be destroyed. And the only way out of here is to repent and turn back seriously to God. And that was not a popular message. 
And the Spirit of God says to Ezekiel, Now eat the scroll, fill your stomach. And in the vision, as Ezekiel eats this scroll, it tastes as sweet as honey. For Ezekiel uh, and the people of his day, honey was the sweetest substance they knew. And it was a prized commodity. I remember seeing a television program, uh, I think it was starring Michael Palin in the Himalayas. And uh, in one episode, a remote mountain tribe risked their lives to get to honey uh, on precipitous cliffs facing you know, the, these, these swarms of killer bees just to get this sweet substance. But there's a paradox here. The bitter words of the prophetic message taste sweet to the prophet. It's a similar sentiment to a contemporary of Ezekiel, Jeremiah the prophet of doom, in Jeremiah chapter 15. It says here, when your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight, for I bear your name, Lord God Almighty. The words of God are sweet, even when their content is bitter. The words of God will ultimately bring life, healing, even through rebuke and judgment, if they lead to repentance. One of the hardest things about preaching online is that you get very little feedback. So if you want to encourage me, please leave me a comment on YouTube or send me an email. And although Ezekiel has some tough material to deliver, he has an even tougher gig. God tells him that he's not being sent to a foreign people, but to his own people. It's not hard for them to understand his message. They speak his language, but it's hard for them to accept his message. That's because they are hard-hearted, rebellious people. They will not so much reject uh, Ezekiel as reject God's message through him. Because this is what they've been doing to God's message and to God's prophets for years. In chapter 2, God calls them thorns and scorpions. We don't have scorpions in this country. But if you've ever tried walking through gorse, it will tear you to shreds. One of the consequences of the COVID-19 lockdown is that for many of us, our front line of mission has shifted from our friends and work colleagues to our nearest and dearest, to our non-Christian spouse or children or parents. They may not be thorns or scorpions. They may not be hard-hearted or particularly rebellious, but they can seem the hardest to share the gospel with. They've heard it all before and seem unmoved by it. Or they've been part of the church before and have drawn back from it for whatever reason. They may have thought out positions for rejecting the claims of the Christian message. And lastly, they know us and they've witnessed all our failings. Someone said it is easier to preach 10 sermons than to live one out in real life. Ezekiel may have had a tough message to deliver to a tough crowd in a tough situation but as the cliche goes when the going gets tough the tough get going and God continues to Ezekiel don't worry hang tough he says I will make you as unyielding and hardened as they are I will make your forehead like the hardest stone harder than flint we might say today I will make you as hard as nails and Ezekiel means God strengthens or God makes heart. And God promises Ezekiel that he'll make him equal to his mission. Now some of you might be thinking, this is not my situation at all. I live with my Christian wife or husband. Or I'm living on my own. The witnessing problem I have is that I don't have anyone to witness to. The tough part of my life now is the loneliness and the boredom of social isolation. And we're still called by God to hang tough. 
from the next part of God's instruction to Ezekiel, I think is relevant to all our situations. And that is, listen carefully and take heart all the words I speak to you. Ezekiel's vision was to eat the scroll of the message, to take God's message to heart. Like Ezekiel, whatever our situation, we are to ingest, we are to listen to, we are to meditate on and live out God's message. We need to hear the word of God. We need to think about it. We need to obey it. We need to put it into practice. Like the wise man who built his house upon the rock. What is God saying in my situation right now? Is it love my spouse, love my children, pray harder for them, work on that annoying habit that I have, pray for that opening conversation, deepen my awareness of your presence in my life and not focus on my loneliness or anxiety. There are many things that God may be speaking to you about today. You have to listen to him and persist in them. And then God says to Ezekiel, go now to your people and speak to them, whether they listen or fail to listen. He says, carry out your mission faithfully, Ezekiel, regardless of the reception you receive. As we read on in Ezekiel, we will find out that many people thought he was nuts. But eventually his message bore fruit. And over time, Israel in exile turned back to God. Like Ezekiel, we must resist the temptation to compromise our faith. And the pressure may come to us in direct opposition, and we should resist that. But also temptation may come through complacency or discouragement. The fact that we don't meet together may slowly weaken our resolve. For example, we have a choice, don't we? We can use our free time to sit around in our pyjamas and watch daytime TV, or we can pray more. We can pray for our not yet saved loved ones. I don't know if prayer works exactly like this, but sometimes we can pray for ages and see little results. But you must keep praying. I guess most of you have seen the old war film, The Damn Busters. And in that, the, the, the bombs are dropped one by one. The bouncy bombs are dropped against the dam wall and the dam doesn't break. But then you see at one moment in the film a small crack emerging in the side of the dam and eventually it bursts. I think maybe prayer is often like that. We just need to be persistent. You heard the acronym PUSH, pray until something happens. We need to continue to pray for our loved ones, our neighbours, the people we want to see come to know Jesus and continue and continue and not give up. Twice Ezekiel recounts in chapter 3, then the Spirit lifted me up. The first time that it says that, Ezekiel was given another glimpse of the glory of God. The second time it was said to him, or he said it, the second time was to take him into his mission situation. And I guess for most of us, God's dealings with us will not be so dramatic. But we mustn't limit God by our past experience. Ezekiel was a prophet energised in his ministry and mission by the Holy Spirit. I think we must too learn to rely on the Holy Spirit in our frontline mission situations too. Some of you know what I mean by the spring harvest effect. The sense of the Spirit that we receive when we're at large Christian events like spring harvest. But we can't rely on gathering together in church for a sense of the Spirit moving in our lives at the moment. We need to trust the truth that each one of us is a temple of the Holy Spirit, that God wants to lift us up by his Spirit into his presence so that we might sense him. 
Usually, I like to end my sermons on a positive note with a kind of go team message. But here the message is decidedly downbeat. Ezekiel says, I went in bitterness and the anger of my spirit with the strong hand of the Lord on me. I came to the exiles who lived at Tel Aviv near the Kiba River and there I sat among them for seven days deeply distressed. Why was Ezekiel angry and distressed? Well, perhaps as a prophet in tune with the heart of God, he could, he could be feeling the anger of God towards his rebellious people. I remember once going to uh, counsel a man who told me he was going to leave his wife. And as I listened to him saying that, I felt inside me really angry. And I'm not usually an angry person. And I said to him, look, God does not want you to leave your wife. I think what I was feeling was actually God's righteous anger in that situation. It was not the right thing for this man to leave his wife. And God wanted to me to communicate that fact to that man. And in the end, he didn't. He relented and he stayed with his wife. Or it could be that Ezekiel is just human. He's angry at the whole desperate situation. Angry at being exiled, angry at not being able to take up his ministry as a priest. Angry at God giving him this tough new prophetic ministry to a people who probably won't listen to him anyway. And he's depressed at the impending destruction of his home city and beloved temple. As the exiled psalmist puts it in Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon we wept when we remembered Zion. Sometimes life is just tough. And we have to walk through it with the strong hand of God upon us. Let's pray. Lord, sometimes you called us to live through difficult times. Lord, help us in those situations not to give up, but to trust in you. Lord, sometimes you call us to share your message with people who don't want to hear. Lord, help us to share the message anyway. Lord, and when we feel angry, when we feel upset and depressed, Lord, help us to trust in you. And to continue to trust in you. Trusting that you will bring us through and show yourself to us. Amen. i
bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.